Monday, early August, a few years ago. As the chief field engineer of a design-build construction firm, my work required me to go out of town several times a month when problems arose. This week was no exception, with my flight leaving from Hartsfield Jackson at 7.21 a.m. The next morning. Considering Atlanta traffic, I'd have to be up around 4 a.m. So I left work a little early on Monday afternoon and headed home. Reagan? I'm home, I called as I entered the kitchen. Her car was in the garage, but she didn't return my greeting, so I made my way upstairs. The shower was running in the Ian Sweet bathroom beyond our bedroom, so I quickly stepped in, opening the shower door behind her. Ah, you scared me, she yelped. You know I always appreciate your love, girl, I replied, and she gave me a couple of hugs. We had a really good time then. That was so amazing, honey, she whispered, and I love you so much. I love you too, baby, I said in reply. The job in Baton Rouge was a mess as I expected, and I spent all of Tuesday afternoon and into the evening plus half the day Wednesday helping get things back on track. I think Etherly, our on-site project manager, learned something in the process, but we'd be monitoring him more closely in the future. After lunch on Wednesday, I drove back down I-10 for a meeting on our job in New Orleans. Mary Jo Bolecki, who I'd trained in Atlanta some years earlier, was now the construction manager for the Orleans project and was scheduled to be going on maternity leave in another month or two. Therefore, because she was a friend and because of her coming absence, I was keeping a close watch on her project to make sure everything was documented so that the person who took over for her would have clear instructions on what needed to be done. As I expected, Mary Jo had everything in order so after dinner with Mary Jo and Ozzy, her husband, on Wednesday evening, and a planning meeting with her and her staff early Thursday morning. I made it to Louis Armstrong for the flight home and then battled through Atlanta traffic to arrive at my office by 1.45. I reported to Mr. Strickland, my boss, on the situation on the Baton Rouge project, my recommendations for upgrading supervision over the on-site team, and my positive report on the work Mary Jo and her team were doing in New Orleans. He agreed to my suggestions on Baton Rouge, asked a few questions about the leadership transition when Mary Jo went on leave, and then told me to take the rest of the afternoon off after I submitted my expense report. Once in my office, I quickly finished it and said, Done, I reached for my phone to send Reagan a text that I'd be home early before heading out the door. It was then that Ethan Gardner, my best friend since third grade and co-worker of the past six years, entered my office and shut the door behind him. Hi Trent, how was your trip? Long but productive Etherly should be able to keep things on track in Baton Rouge for the rest of the project if he watches his supervisors a little better. Now though, I'm tired and I'm done, so while I value our friendship, Ethan, Mr. Strickland told me to leave for the day. His face clouded on that. So I explained with a laugh, no, he didn't fire me. I just had so many hours on the trip helping them straighten out the mess that Mr. S. told me to take the rest of the afternoon off to maintain good relationships with everyone here in accounting. Therefore, I'm going to stop by the store, get some flowers and a bottle of wine, and be in a good mood for her when Reagan gets home. Anything work-related can wait until tomorrow. To my surprise, Ethan raised a hand and said, rather forcefully, Trent, stop. It's not about work. I'm so sorry, buddy, but I really need to talk to you now. It's dot, dot, dot. It's well about Reagan. She's... What? What's wrong with Reagan fear stabbed my heart? Something had happened to her and no one had been able to reach me because I'd been on the airplane. But why hadn't I received a call since? With me having interrupted him, he stammered, Trent, she's been unfaithful to you while your traveling anger lit my face as I looked at the guy I'd considered my best friend for practically forever. Reagan had told me she'd been a real free spirit in college in the years that followed, enjoying intimacy whenever and wherever she could find it we'd even been intimate twice on our first date. I remembered, but as we became more serious and started talking about building a life together, she'd left those days behind, seeking therapy for a while and committing to settling down and raising a family. While committed to me, she still enjoyed intimacy, a lot, but she'd definitely put her adventurous days behind her. That's not funny, Ethan. It's not a bit funny and I don't appreciate it. I think you'd better leave and reflect seriously on our friendship before you step foot in my office again. His face looked pained as he replied, 
I know it's not funny, Trent, and I hate having to tell you more than you can know, but I dot 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 well. I genuinely believe it's true. See, I heard it from Jake Campbell, who heard it from his friend Clay, who heard it from a friend of his. Clay's friend was the one she was unfaithful with. From what she accidentally mentioned to him afterward, he's not the only one she's involved with, which is why he didn't keep it a secret. He was angry that she was cheating on him. I knew it wasn't true, that it couldn't be true. So I was extremely upset that I was ready to confront Ethan for falling for such a stupid prank. However, I knew my wife a lot better than Ethan did, and so my anger turned to the others who would spread such rumors and to the nameless person who started them. On second thought, I wasn't giving Ethan a pass either in fact. I was doubly upset that my supposed best friend was the one helping them spread such lies. Ethan, I'm going to tell you this once. It's not true, not a word of it. And if you ever, I mean ever, repeat a word of that again, I'll confront you about it. Now, you better leave before I decide to do it anyway. Ethan was about five foot six and weighed 150 pounds, if that. He'd always been a scrawny kid, the typical nerd, so he knew that I, at my size, could do it if I wanted. It looked like the weight of the world was on his shoulders as he looked down at the ground and slowly shook his head. He looked up at me, and I could see the pain in his eyes as he said, Trent. I'm really sorry. We've been best friends for a long, long time, so you know I'd never want to hurt you. But I really think that not telling you would hurt you a lot worse in the long run. And buddy, you know that I know you well enough to know that you'd react just like this. You've always had a hot temper, so how many times did I have to step in to calm you down to keep you out of trouble or detention in high school? Trent, I wouldn't have told you this, any of it, if I didn't think it was true. I'm going but dot 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 here. You may not believe me, but here's the name of the investigator who my cousin hired when he thought his wife was being unfaithful. This lady's good, and if she tells you that Reagan's betraying you, well, you'll know it's the truth. I took a deep breath and held it for a moment, trying to calm down. I'm not sure if it worked, but it did help clear my thoughts and put things in better perspective. Ethan was right we'd been best friends since his family moved in down the block when we were little, and we'd been close ever since. We'd both been intelligent. I'd been second in our high school class in the North Georgia mountains, second only to him, but he'd been the level-headed nerd who kept us out of trouble when he could, while I'd been the hot-headed jock who physically got us through a few tough situations when his efforts didn't work. We'd gone to different colleges, me into engineering with a construction management focus at Tech and him into accounting at UGA. I'd grown a lot over time without him there to help manage my temper though I must admit that a few incidents along the way without his guidance helped that process. When I heard about an opening in my firm's accounting department, I let him know about how much I liked the firm. To my surprise, he'd applied and I'd put in a good word for him, so we'd been working together for the past six years, including through all the time that Reagan and I dated before marrying nearly five years earlier. In retrospect, I realized that, while I didn't think for a minute that his story was true, Ethan must have been led to believe it was true and that he was telling me to protect me, not to deliberately hurt me. With a slow exhale, I asked, your cousin's wife. Was she unfaithful? I mean, oh yeah. And Miss Hightower got the proof what happened to them, Ethan grimaced. He divorced her but still has to see her twice every week when they swap kids. He loves those kids and will do anything to protect them, which is a good thing because he hates her so much he'd have probably killed her and gladly gone to jail by now otherwise. I'm so sorry, man. He stepped out of my office as he answered his phone, closing the door back behind him. That left me alone to think about what he had said about his cousin and to dwell on his allegations. I felt sorry for the guy having a woman that he loved and trusted who'd betray him, however, not knowing the circumstances. Most of my sympathy went to the kids. They didn't choose their parents or the mess they'd been born into. The reason was that Reagan and I were discussing expanding our family soon. We wanted a boy and a girl, if the genetic odds worked out in our favor, but we were considering having three children if we had two of the same gender in our first two tries. I sat at my desk, staring at the door, for a couple of minutes, trying to calm myself before picking up my things and heading out. I was going home to see my wife, trying to put everything Ethan had said out of my mind. Unfortunately, the idea that he planted lingered, refusing to be forgotten, as I made my way to the highway for the trip home. No, I didn't believe it not for a minute. In fact, 
I absolutely refused to believe it and would have found the whole thing laughable if it wasn't so serious. As I drove north on the highway to my exit, I considered letting Reagan know about the rumors, but something stopped me. While I was sure it wasn't true, there was no reason to upset her that people including Ethan were spreading such terrible rumors about her. After a quick stop at the grocery store, I kept quiet when Reagan rushed into my arms as I walked into the kitchen from the garage. You're home early, I said, but that was as much as I got out as our lips met, and we tried to make up for missing each other since Tuesday morning. When we pulled apart, she nodded. I thought you'd be home early, so I worked late the last two nights to leave early today and greet you. God, I've missed you so much, Trent, she said, hugging me tightly. I smiled. I missed you too, baby. Later that evening, Reagan and I had another moment, starting with us cuddling on the couch. Afterward, the rumors resurfaced in my mind. Ethan and I had been friends for such a long time that I realized he would have never told me like he did unless he actually believed it. Reagan fell asleep in bed soon afterward, a pretty smile on her face as she drifted off. I sat up in bed trying to read my book, but the words on the page refused to sink in. My thoughts were on my wife and the crazy story my best friend had told. As much love as Reagan had shown me, on Monday before my trip and today after I came home, I knew that the reports he had received were false and that I had to prove it to him or it would damage our friendship even more than his supposed warning had. I went to sleep that evening, still trying to figure out what to do, but as I drove to work on Friday morning, a plan came to me. I'd contact the private investigator that Ethan had suggested. However, I wouldn't be reaching out to get her to prove that Reagan had cheated on me. No, not believing it anyway, I'd get MS. P.I. To prove that Reagan hadn't. On Friday morning, I called Donna Hightower's office and scheduled the first available appointment on Monday afternoon. It was in Midtown, so I gave myself a little extra time and arrived at the office about 10 minutes early. Having been well-employed for several years before marrying Reagan, I had kept my sizable investment account in my name which gave me the ability to surprise her with occasional gifts or trips without her knowing beforehand. This time, I'd use some of the funds to hire the investigator, and Reagan would never need to know about the ridiculous rumor once MS. Hightower proved it false. At two, the receptionist called me and led me into a conference room just down the hall where a well-dressed black woman in pressed black pants, an expensive white dress, and a red scarf stood up from the table to greet me as the receptionist closed the door behind me. Good afternoon, Mr. Jirao. Welcome to Hightower Private Investigation Services. I'm Donna Hightower. How can we assist you? She was tall and had a great figure she appeared younger in person than her online biography suggested. She had a warm smile, but her eyes seemed to be analyzing me the whole time, picking up on my body language and any signs of tension, I suspected. Hello, Miss Hightower. I'm Trent Jirao and I appreciate you meeting with me on such short notice. My problem is relatively simple. I travel two or three times in an average month, usually for one or two nights. As a result, the someone has dreamed up a story that my wife is being unfaithful. I want you to investigate and prove she's not, that she hasn't been. Without expression, she started asking me questions, and over the next little while, I told her everything I knew about the claim and a great many things about Reagan. All while making me realize the problem might not be as simple as I believed. Her questions were insightful, and she asked a number of follow-ups to clarify or gain additional information, making brief notes along the way, particularly about Reagan's past romantic history, both before our relationship began and our history together. I felt drained when she finally put down her pen and said, Thank you for that information, Mr. Jirao. According to the client information sheet you filled out before coming in, you have undergrad and master's degrees in engineering from Georgia Tech. How familiar are you with philosophy and our legal system, and, more specifically, the burden of proof that wasn't a question I was expecting? Heem him. I had an introductory philosophy course as an undergrad, and I've been a witness in a couple of court cases with my firm, but as far as the details and the focus of your question, no, not very, she nodded. You've made a specific request for me to prove that your wife has not had an affair. Mr. Jirao, that's what's called proving a negative. In some cases, something can be proven to have never happened. For instance, a specific wine glass has never been broken 
because it holds wine and you can visually observe that it's in pristine condition with no cracks. That's easy, but what about a person? She seemed to think for a moment before continuing. Let's see dot 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 I can prove that I didn't go out of town and rob a bank somewhere yesterday because I have a positive alibi affirming that I was here in town all day. However, what about one day last week, last year, or even a decade ago? You see, Mr. Jirao, in most cases, there are no irrefutable records over any significant period of time that will prove a negative dot 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 so. Let's apply that to your case. I might have one of my investigators surveil your wife for a week or even a month and be able to tell you with reasonable certainty that she did not, or as the case may be, did have an affair during that time, but I can't prove that she didn't have one the day or the week or perhaps several years before our investigation began. For that reason, proving a negative doesn't work in your type of case, so the cloud of this accusation really will be hanging over her head forever I muttered, having already known deep inside that what Miss Hightower said was true. Perhaps, but if we keep her under surveillance during the right circumstances and nothing happens, then you can infer from the action she takes, or doesn't take, that something is probably true. What we'll be able to tell you beyond a reasonable doubt is that she either did or did not step out on you during the surveillance period, and that might also allow us to turn up evidence of past discretions, if there are any. However, the challenge is that we'll never be able to tell you with any degree of certainty that she never has done it. Now, if that scenario will work for you, Mr. Jirao will gladly take your case. If not, we'll wish you well and wish you well and wish you luck finding someone honest who will do as you ask. Understanding her point, I hired Hightower Private Investigation Services and then spent a couple more hours with one of Miss Hightower's investigators answering more questions, filling in backgrounds, and planning those right circumstances she'd mentioned. I was working in the office in Atlanta all week, so on Saturday evening after Reagan went to bed, I tripped a circuit breaker in the panel in the basement. I didn't notice anything on Sunday morning, but by the time we got home after church and lunch with a couple of new members, the house was noticeably hotter upstairs. Reagan complained at once, and I said I'd go downstairs and check the breaker. I flipped a few circuits that didn't matter, off and then back on, and then went back upstairs. I couldn't find anything wrong, so I'm going to call the HVAC service, please. It's going to be too hot to sleep up there tonight if you don't. I dialed our regular HVAC firm and entered their automated system, pushing some buttons to go from menu to menu for a bit until I'd been on the line for nearly two minutes and then hung up. Then, I called the number that Donna Hightower had given me. Hi, this is Trent Giroux. We have a problem with our upstairs AC system. How soon can you get someone out here to check on it? Tomorrow morning at 10? Okay. I guess that will have to do. Thanks, I'll see you then. Reagan came in to hear the end of it. It's way too hot up there, so we're sleeping in the guest room down here tonight. It can be like we're in a hotel room somewhere, she added with a grin. With Reagan's suggestion in mind, we rearranged that bed that night and I felt better than I had since Ethan passed along the false accusation against her. There was no way that Reagan could love me so much and be doing what the person who claimed she was messing around said she was doing. We got up on Monday morning, and Reagan had me strip the sheets and throw them in the laundry on my way to the shower. I worked from home on Monday morning and met the HVAC guy, a subcontractor regularly used by Hightower Private Investigation Services, at 10, as planned. I showed him our house, and he went to work while I went downstairs and turned the circuit breaker back on. An hour later, he was done. These are activated by motion and stay on for five minutes after the motion ends. They have a fiber optic lens with a wide viewing angle so they can record what you need with a very low probability of them being observed unless someone has a specific reason to look for them. These cameras will capture everything with the quality being good enough for legal purposes but not good enough for public consumption. We have three in your bedroom, one in each of the other rooms, and one focused on each of the bathroom doors. If there's anything going on in the view of any of these, We'll catch it after paying him the fee for installing them and the rental fee for two weeks. I thanked him and headed to work. The house was cool when I got home, but I wasn't. Baby, some issues have come up on our hotel job in Orlando, so I'm having to add that to this week's trip I was already going to be in Tampa on Tuesday night. But I'd worked it out to visit the Orlando site, too. It was short notice for Loretta to be rearranging things with the airlines, 
so my flight from Orlando won't be in until late on Friday evening. I'll try to swap for an earlier flight if anything's available, but Loretta said the odds looked pretty lousy. I'm sorry. I'm going to miss you so much, said Reagan, but let's see about making up for a little bit of that with a grin. She took my hand and led me to the couch in the family room. With both of us so excited, she pushed me back and hugged me like she was training for a deep hug. No, like she was a hug champion. We held each other tight. We swayed gently, enjoying the closeness. I held her tight, smiling at her, knowing she was my partner, mine alone, and that our few days apart or the days that followed would prove Ethan's false accusation wrong, so I cherished our moment. Grinning, I gently caressed her, and she responded with affection. We shared a sweet moment before she got up and went to the bathroom. I cleaned up quickly, knowing that there was nothing wrong with our marriage other than the unfounded claims from someone who'd never, ever know what it was like to experience true love with my partner. The meetings in Tampa went well, and the issues that followed in Orlando were easy. In fact, I would have normally handled them remotely, but making an on-site appearance helped keep our supervisory team on their toes. Once everything was resolved, I spent some time on-site looking at the quality of the construction and providing feedback and pointing out issues and potential pitfalls to the assistant project manager who showed me around. He was young but bright and I made a mental note that he would be ready for more responsibility before too long. I could have flown out on Thursday afternoon if I had been able to get a flight, but I didn't bother trying. Reagan wasn't expecting me until Friday evening, so I was going to give her every possible minute of that time to prove to Miss Hightower that she had plenty of opportunity, but that she wasn't being unfaithful to me. Therefore, I worked in my hotel room through the afternoon and early Thursday evening made my way to one of the famous Orlando gun ranges that offer the rental of machine guns for a short duration of fire in addition to regular pistols and rifles. I stuck with renting a couple of pistols and let the tourist dads getting away from their kids and the Disney or Universal scenes for a break waste their hard-earned cash feeding the rapid-fire guns. On Friday, I worked in the trailer on our job site until it was time to head to the airport. Traffic on I-285 on Friday evening was probably as bad as it would have been going through downtown, and 75 wasn't much better. I breathed a sigh of relief when I finally reached our exit and was thrilled when I walked into the house and my loving wife ran into my arms. She saw I looked stressed, so she got me a soda, and we snuggled on the couch and talked for a bit before she led me upstairs. We spent a really good time together and I was looking at her, knowing in my heart that this woman was mine, all mine, and that she always would be. Reagan went to the gym to work out on Saturday while I did yard work. Since I had a bit of time while coming inside for a drink of water, and to see how the Braves were doing in their game, I opened my laptop and checked my personal email account. To my relief, nothing was there from the special address that Donna Hightower's investigator had given me. I checked again on Sunday afternoon while she was running some errands and doing the grocery shopping. This time I blinked hard, several times, before hesitantly clicking the message to open it. As I did, I muttered, please Lord, let this just be an update. Dear Mr. Jirao, your order will be ready Monday at 11 a.m. Please contact our office to arrange delivery. Larson Tool Works. My hand trembled as I closed the message, deleted it, and then permanently deleted it from the trash folder. Reagan noticed that I didn't look good when she returned home and I avoided hugging her. Yeah, not feeling too good, I replied. Don't want you getting sick too. Here, let me give you a hug, and then you go lie down while I fix dinner. Hopefully you'll feel better and be able to eat in a little while she gave me that hug, but worried beyond belief, I only patted her back and put my head against hers. As I did, I caught the scent of flowers. I didn't eat Sunday evening and was up very early on Monday morning. I thought about it as I tried to sleep the smell of flowers in her hair wasn't her usual shampoo, conditioner, or perfume. I didn't want to believe that anything was going on, but the unusual smell and the ominous message made me question whether there really could be something going on. She hadn't been gone that long, had she? No, she couldn't have had time to do her shopping and do anything, any messing around on the side, right? Yes, it had to have been one of those cosmetics ladies that spray perfume samples at the store. Confirming my appointment first thing Monday morning, I arrived at Miss Hightower's office just before 11 a.m., I was escorted into the same conference room as the first time and, similar to before, Ms. Hightower greeted me. This time, 
she motioned to the seat and said, Mr. Jarau, we've concluded our investigation early, and I'm afraid I have bad news, she pushed a file over to me, and then sat back in silence as I opened it. My world, always so ordered, crumbled around me as I skipped reading the report and turned straight to the photos. There she was, with a man dot 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 I in our bedroom. Another shot in a different position but still in our bedroom followed that. The next photo, apparently taken with a camera with night vision, showed her together with him in the back seat of a car. Then there was one of the two of them in front of a hotel hugging goodbye in one, and then parting but their hands still together in the next. Wait. The guy in this photo doesn't look like what I can see of the guy in the first. I'm sorry. It's all in the report, but we documented her with three different guys in four encounters through Saturday, and then a second repeat of the second one yesterday afternoon, this time at a private residence. What I exclaimed, the news and all the numbers overwhelming me. But dot dot dot, but she went shopping yesterday, her look was serious as she nodded. Mr. Jarrell, Mrs. Jarrell did a little on Saturday afternoon after her second encounter with the second guy, but only went to the grocery store on Sunday. You might want to check the receipts or perhaps the credit card if she didn't use cash. But, but she was going to the gym on Saturday, I bleated still trying not to believe the clearly laid out evidence in front of me. Miss Hightower shook her head. I'm sorry, Mr. Giroux, based on the photo of her coming out of that hotel with the second guy. We believe she participated in some activities. All right, but believe me, she didn't get anywhere close to an actual gymnasium. How could this be, I demanded, my anger finally overcoming my disbelief. Letting three different guys be intimate with her in one week and it's not like I didn't take care of her both before and after. Miss Hightower raised a hand to calm me. I'm not a psychiatrist, Mr. Jarao, just a damn good investigator, and a pretty good judge of human character. She seems to be obsessed with intimacy, like a thrill seeker, always in search of that next experience, whenever, wherever, and however she can get it. And she appears to go well beyond the normal limits to do just that and cover up what she's done to keep you from finding out. The flowers I breathed. The scent of flowers in her hair. She took a shower and washed her hair after meeting the guy yesterday. Maybe that, but based on the amount of time they were in there, more likely a quick wash or a spritz of something. See, from what we can tell from following her and watching the video feeds, she's very careful about what she's doing, and she's meticulous about the appearance of intimacy, even changing the sheets and bedding on your bed between partners, but in our bed I started only to remember that she'd even changed the sheets in the guest bed after our special night just a week earlier. Yes, two of the three nights you were gone, she had encounters she picks up her partner, please. Don't call them that. Unfaithful, disloyal individuals are what they are. She gave a little humph and a nod at my comment. At least one, yes, we actually don't have the name of the first one, but the third is single, however. Assuming he knew of her marital status, that makes him complicit in her actions and an adulterer under state law. The other, though, the second one who seems to be her regular dot 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 partner. Well, he is definitely an adulterer. We were able to identify him and find out that he is married disgusting, I breathed, opening the file and searching for a page with his photo at the top. My fists clenched and it was all I could do to avoid pounding the table. Damn. I think she works with this disgusting person. I was about to get to that. Noah Woolever, age 32, married, and from what we can tell, your wife's supervisor at her firm as of a few months ago. Being a large, important firm with multiple offices, they don't publicize their corporate management structure, so it's possible he's in another, possibly similar department. I shook my head. No, you got it right. Mrs. Allenby was promoted in late spring, I think, and Mr. Woolliver became her new manager. Reagan never called him by his first name and she said he wasn't very social, so I haven't met him yet, but she did point him out to me once when I picked her up when her car was in the shop. It was Miss Hightower's turn with the head shake, though this one looked like disbelief. Not very social with the spouses of his lovers, no doubt she chuckled. A convenient excuse to keep the two of you apart. Anyway, mister. Wooliver has no record or outstanding warrants, but he does have some unpaid parking tickets. Your wife met him at a bar on Wednesday evening and drove him to your home for just over an hour before driving him back and letting him out by his car, 
which was how we got his name through DMV records. We found his firm info from a web search and the professional network online that scoundrel I breathed, clenching and opening my fists to keep from accidentally breaking something like my fingers. Miss Hightower continued, Easy, Mr. Giroux. We're not done yet. Next, she met him at the hotel on Saturday afternoon, and then again yesterday, but this time, like I said earlier, at a residence. According to tax records, his residence, Mr. Giroux. If Mrs. Wooliver had arrived just minutes earlier or your wife had left minutes later, Mrs. Giroux's secret would probably have been revealed too high-whispered. Her game's already up, but she just doesn't know it. You know, Miss Hightower, I was pretty wild in my younger years, chasing any woman who seemed to express interest. It took a long while, but I finally realized it wasn't getting me anywhere. While I love a good dash dash ah dot 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 intimacy dash, I eventually found myself wanting more than just a cheap thrill and I met Reagan at a perfect time for that. She admitted to having been fairly wild in college, too, and that she'd had a number of partners during that time, but she said she loved me, that she wanted to settle down, that dot 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 dot. I couldn't go on and Miss Hightower patted my hand. I gave her a weak smile and thanks and looked back at the sheet on Noah Wooliver. My face hardened as I thought of what I'd like to do to the cheating, lying, disloyal, two-timing Miss Hightower gripped my hand again, harder this time, causing me to look up into her eyes. Mr. Girau, I'm sorry for you that this has turned out like it has, but I need to warn you, as I do with all my clients, to not let the pain you're feeling make you do something that's not who you really are. When a person finds out their significant other has been unfaithful, they often want payback to make the cheater hurt, but if you do and you go too far dot 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 well, if you do, it can potentially ruin your life. Are you getting this with her grip on my hand? She made me nod before she went on. Don't let her mistake destroy you and the future you could have. If you strike back too hard, you could find yourself going too far and potentially end up in jail for a time or maybe even in prison, possibly for years. You can lose your job and most everything you've worked your whole adult life for. You don't have children, so you don't have that to worry about. But that doesn't mean you still can't make huge trouble for yourself. Whatever you decide, just be careful and remember that it's her mistake, not yours. So much was swirling in my head. Cheating? Confirmed. Children? So close but not now. Revenge? Maybe not, but repayment? Yes, definitely. I wouldn't be the fool who let my anger destroy me. I'd be careful controlling my emotions, but I'd be as deceptive and ruthless in my carefully measured response as she'd been in fooling me for however long she'd been doing it. I knew I'd never hurt her physically, I wasn't that kind of person, but making her hurt. Yeah, I will be. Careful, I mean. But believe me, Miss Hightower, if that's the way my soon-to-be former wife wants it, any way she can get it, that's the way it will be. I'll be sure not to take it a bit too far, but believe me, it's going to be so close and she's going to feel every bit of the pain she's caused me to feel. Every. Single. Bit. Miss Hightower sighed, realizing that she couldn't stop me but she made one last try at tempering me. Okay, please, be careful, mister. Jarrow, that you remember what you said, that you don't go too far. It's a lot easier to slip over the edge than you might expect. I don't want what you do to come back to bite you dot 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 or haunt you. For a divorce attorney, Miss Hightower recommended George C. Godwin. He agreed to see me after hours, so I spent the next two hours on a bench in Piedmont Park plotting my escape dot 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 and my revenge. Then I downloaded all of my records and went to see him. Mr. Godwin was an elderly black man, Miss Hightower's youngest uncle. It turned out and was as short, hefty, and jovial as she'd been tall, regal, and reserved, but he knew family law inside and out. He also knew the Georgia legal system like the back of his hand since he'd been practicing law for nearly 50 years. George was very informal, insisting that we call each other by our first names and chatting for a bit before getting into why I was choosing divorce over an attempt at reconciliation. When I showed him the file with the photos, he gave a long, low whistle. Guess that answers that. Okay, what we're going to need, I handed him the flash drive with all the records that Miss Hightower had suggested so he plugged it into his laptop, said Hachim a few times, and then said it a couple more. That girl really knows her stuff. Trent, 
This looks complete, so I'll put it together and let you know when we're ready to serve and file. Can you have it by next Monday? Oh, I can have it by then, but the overtime's going to cost you do it. Please then I went over my plan with him, including an extra request. When I was done, his face was expressionless. You've got to be careful, Trent, really careful. I know you're angry and you have every right to be, but you're starting into a legal proceeding where you can't go too far since a judge will be deciding the case based on law. But if you don't think that appearances and attitudes come into play, then I've got a really fine bridge to sell you over the big river that runs through downtown Atlanta. I forced a smile, knowing there aren't any rivers, big or otherwise, in downtown Atlanta. I got home late on Monday evening. Claiming exhaustion and needing rest after my little illness, I avoided hugging Reagan and stayed entirely out of her personal space. However, she needed something so I agreed to a foot rub. For those few minutes, I was able to put most everything about how she'd betrayed me out of my mind by imagining that she was a massage client desperately trying to relax. Still feigning vestiges of my illness that had never actually been, I showered and brushed my teeth, trying to get all traces of negativity off of me and out of my system. I was up early and silently on Tuesday morning, slipping out of the house to head to catch my plane to Charlotte without waking her. On Thursday evening, I made the call I'd been dreading. Ethan, hey. It's Trent. Listen, buddy, I need to apologize, big time. You were right and I was as wrong as I could be. She played me Ethan, being the closest thing I have to a brother, forgave me at once and asked how he could help. I delayed getting home until late Friday and then complained of exhaustion to avoid having any intimate contact. Reagan wasn't happy and tried to turn me on, inviting me to engage in some activities that would usually arouse me. I'll just watch okay as messed up as it had turned out to be. She still had a really beautiful body, and as much as I'd come to hate her dark soul, I still found myself enjoying witnessing her sensuality, thinking that she could easily find a career in modeling if her day job ever fell through. Only my seething anger and disgust kept me from jumping her and engaging in any further activities. On Saturday morning, I went to see my parents to help my dad with a home project that supposedly carried over to Sunday morning. I really wanted to let him know what was going on, but I knew that I needed to wait until everything went down. Then the time would be right, and it would be too late to let anything slip out that shouldn't. Therefore, I called Reagan late Saturday afternoon to let her know I wouldn't be home until the next afternoon, but when I did, I got the distinct impression when she answered that she wasn't home and that she probably wasn't alone. I held my tongue, giving a perfunctory but completely false love you before ending the call. On Sunday afternoon while Reagan was out, doubtless meeting someone who didn't deserve her time, Mr. Godwin sent me a text. I quickly called him, and he confirmed that all would be ready. The process server he was employing had agreed to serve the papers promptly at 11 a.m. On Monday morning, in accordance with my special request, and to send me a text message as soon as he met her. I immediately called in for a personal day, and then headed out, leaving a note for Reagan that I'd had something come up for work and to call me at the office if she needed me. I drove to the office and spent the rest of the evening finalizing my plans. Reagan called twice that evening, and I told her both times that it was taking longer and that I'd be even later than I'd told her before. I promised that I'd take off early on Monday afternoon and that we'd spend the whole evening together. That must have been what she wanted to hear because her unhappy mood turned light and cheerful and she told me she loved me before we finally ended the call. I was lying to her, of course, but considering the web of lies and deceit that she'd spun around me, I shook my head and said, Them's the breaks, baby. Turnabout's tough luck. She stirred when I got into bed with her late that night for what I knew would be the last time, but I didn't quite wake her. On Monday morning, my plan went a bit astray when my dream turned out to be reality. Reagan had started loving on me to wake me. I briefly considered pushing her off, throwing her to the floor, but doing so would ruin all my plans. After Reagan left for work, I walked through the house with a wide piece of bright painter's tape and applied it to anything that was specifically mine or mine prior to our marriage. Anything that was community property, I figured she'd get as part of our settlement or it would be donated to the charity thrift store. At 7.45, Ethan showed up and a crew from a moving company arrived just minutes later. I helped them get started 
and then Ethan took over supervising while I finished packing what I needed for the short term. Everything on the truck would be taken to storage. Reagan hadn't noticed, but I'd cleaned out my gun safe and taken everything in it to my parents' house to put in my dad's safe on Saturday. I was almost done and about to leave the rest with Ethan when Amy, a neighbor and a friend of Reagan's, saw the truck and came out to ask if we were moving. Fortunately, I reached her before she could look into the truck or see that I'd put a bunch of stuff in the back of my SUV in the garage. Shesh, I said with a grin. I'm surprising Reagan with some new furniture for our upcoming anniversary. Five years next week. I'm getting rid of some old furniture and some clutter from the house before they deliver it tonight. It's a surprise and is a bit early due to their delivery schedule. So please don't mention it to her or anyone else until after she says something to you about it. She agreed, matching my grin, and I went on my way. The news would probably be all over the neighborhood by noon, so I was glad H hour was 11. I gave each of the movers a generous tip, and then I shook hands with and thanked Ethan before heading to the bank. I was there when they opened at 9 a.m. and took out half of the money in our accounts in the form of a cashier's check. I was at a credit union minutes later and deposited the cashier's check into a new account I'd opened online. At 10.45, I pulled into the parking lot of an office building in Sandy Springs and opened my laptop. I'd already applied for a new credit card in my name. So with the current card showing a zero balance, I closed it. That took longer than planned, and I was starting to sweat the time as a result. However, it was done by 10.57, so I logged into our family email that listed both of us and waited for the text message, which popped in on my phone right at 11 a.m., as planned. Process server just asked for her. Receptionist said on the way. A minute later, another text arrived. Process server, she's in the lobby now. Almost shaking with nerves, I uploaded the message I'd already prepared to our email. I'd considered accessing Reagan's work email and sending the version I'd written, and really wanted to send from there, since I knew her password. But Donna Hightower's warning about going too far, and her uncle's confirmation that doing what I wanted might leave me in very hot water with the judge, and maybe even in trouble for a night put an end to that idea. For now. The message was going to a number of our friends and relatives. It spread the word that something had happened between us and that I had filed for divorce as a result. Three photos were included in the file rather than as attachments so they wouldn't be stripped from the message. Reagan's and Noah's faces were both visible in each of the photos. However, again heeding the warnings about not going too far, the photos were carefully cropped and blurred to obscure any private body parts, but it was quite obvious what was happening and, with the timestamp, when. The second message, the one I'd really wanted to send, remained unused on the flash drive. Finally, the message wasn't being sent to Reagan or Noah. There was no need to warn them of the coming storm. The message was ready and looked right, so I hit send. After confirming that it went out correctly, I quickly logged out, closed the laptop, and put it under my seat. My phone was ringing at 11.03. It was Reagan, so I answered the call. Trent. What is this? Divorce. Why? I thought we were happy together. Did you find someone else I laughed at her hysteria? You thought we were happy? No, I thought we were happy until I found out what you were doing. Yes, I know. Look in the back of the envelope where I had my lawyer slip something in. I heard her cussing and fretting over the phone, promising me undying love, just as she'd done in front of God, the pastor, and many of our friends and relatives at the church five wasted years ago. Oh no, she screamed over the phone. Oh no, Trent, it's not what it looks like seriously. I'm sure it was just an accident that you're both close in our bedroom and that he just needed some air in his balloon. No, Trent, let me explain no, Reagan. I don't think there's enough time in the world for you to adequately explain this. We're done. My lawyer's contact information is in that packet. If you need anything, go through him. I hung up with her still talking, or rather, practically screaming through the phone. When she realized I wasn't there anymore, she called back again, so I sent it to voicemail. She left one, a long one it seemed, and a text message from her popped in moments later. The voicemail was more of the same, denials and lies, so it was deleted, as were the text message and the three texts and the next voicemail that followed in quick succession. Not wanting to hear her fake tears, listen to any more lies, excuses, or apologies, 
and definitely not wanting to hear any more promises since she'd already broken the sacred one that really counted. I didn't listen to the new message or read the texts before deleting them. Then I blocked Reagan's number. Right after that, I dialed my father-in-law's number. With Bob and Chessie being my friends as well as my in-laws, I hadn't sent them the message either. Hi, Bob, it's Trent. I hate to be calling you at work like this, but it's important, and I think you need to hear this from me rather than secondhand. And I'm doing it now rather than later because things just got really messy. I think I heard him gulp over the phone. What's going on, son Bob? I'm really sorry to have to tell you this, but because Reagan couldn't keep her promises, I'm having to end our marriage. Trent, no. I know my daughter's history, but she's changed. You can't be serious about this, holding something over her from a long time ago, Bob. I'd never do that, but she's relapsed, big time, and it's not a long time ago. Two weeks ago, when I was out of town, she went crazy. I have the places, the dates, and the times to prove it, along with photos and even videos of some of them. It's been killing me ever since I found out, and I hate to have to tell you, especially over the phone, but you need to know that it's not something I'm doing because I want to. It's because I can't trust her anymore, and I can't go on like this. Therefore, I'm ending it now the paperwork was filed this morning, and she's been served. No, I can't believe this. She promised that she was past that stage there was desperation and complete denial in his voice. She promised all of us, Bob, but her promises apparently didn't mean enough for her to keep them. If she had stayed true to them, and to me, I would have loved her forever. You know that. It's way too late for that now, though, and the love I had for her is gone, dried up and swept away. However, I still love you and your wife, and I don't want to hurt either of you, so I'm telling you this directly rather than through an email my soon-to-be former father-in-law expressed great sorrow at what his daughter had done to us as a couple and to his family and me as friends. With regret in both our voices, we said goodbye. I quickly called Chessie, too, but it went to voicemail I suspected that Bob had her on speed dial, so I left a short message. It was now 11 to 16 a.m., and I was up to the only part of my plan that caused me hesitation. If I went through with this part, I was going to be hurting someone I didn't know, someone who probably didn't deserve it, but not doing it might result in even worse hurt in the long run. Therefore, I put on sunglasses, a baseball cap, and a lanyard with my laminated photo ID for a delivery company that doesn't, to my knowledge, exist, but with Ethan's phone number at the bottom. He knew to answer any calls that he didn't know between 11 and 11 and 11 to 30 a.m. With sunshine couriers and process serving, I chewed a piece of gum and went into the building. At the security desk, I said, Hi, I'm TC, Jero from Sunshine Couriers and Process Serving. I have a special delivery package for a missus. Melissa Wooliver. The security guard frowned. Those have to go to receiving in the back on the bottom level, nope. The courts say otherwise, I said, doing my best imitation of Chevy Chase in the old Fletch movie. Special delivery requires photo ID and a personal signature. It's usually handled best if done quietly, but we can make it a scene if you'd prefer, and I'll end up having to run all over town to find her, causing her more trouble in the long run. No, wait, said the guard. What do you need? I go up to her workplace, meet her in the lobby, show her my ID, and get her signature. I'll be out of there in five minutes. No problems, he nodded slowly. You need a visitor's badge to go up. I'll hold on to your ID while you have the badge all right, I agreed, handing over my driver's license. Reluctantly, he took it and gave me the badge. Come straight back. You get your license back. He said, holding up my ID when you return the badge to me. Got it. I tipped my cap to him and blew a little bubble before heading to the elevator. On the third floor, I approached the front desk at Melissa Wooliver's workplace a few moments later. The receptionist seemed even more hesitant than the guard, but she called Mrs. Wooliver to the reception area. Spotting a trash can, I threw away the bubble gum and took off my baseball cap, placing it in the bag that I pretended was my courier pouch. I left behind my Fletch persona. Melissa Wooliver was very attractive, in her late twenties or early thirties with tan skin, dark brown hair, and lovely brown eyes that made me think she might have some Hispanic heritage. She looked uneasy as she entered the lobby. When the receptionist pointed at me, Mrs. Wooliver hesitated before walking over. 
Joan said you have something for me to sign, she said hesitantly. No, I'm sorry, Mrs. Woolever, I'm Trent Giroux. You don't actually need to sign, but I do need to give you this since it concerns you what dot 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 what is it, Mrs. Woolover, I'm sorry to tell you this, but your husband has been in a relationship with my wife. I whispered my words and handed her a cropped photo of them together in bed. There are documents proving everything, including explicit photos and videos. In the envelope, tears streamed down her face as she shook her head in denial. This has to be fake. Noah promised me. It's not fake, Mrs. Woolever. I paid a detective agency to find out what was happening with my wife after I heard a rumor about an affair. They proved the opposite, that she was indeed having an affair. There's an affidavit in the envelope stating that everything you see here is real, unedited, and obtained legally with my permission. The private investigation firm and my attorney both assure me that it will be accepted as evidence in court if you choose to pursue legal action. As of this morning, I am. But he promised, she whispered, tears pouring. She leaned towards me and I put my arm around her, patting her back. He said the first one was a mistake, that it was just a moment of weakness, and that it wouldn't happen again. W.E. dot 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 W.E. took precautions to ensure it wouldn't and now he backslides and does it again? Why? I don't know, Mrs. Woolever, but this time it wasn't a moment of weakness. It was carefully planned, and it didn't happen just once. You'll find documentation of three encounters between them in five days in the envelope. She gripped onto my shirt and shook her head rapidly against my chest as she realized the extent of her husband's betrayal. At about five feet six inches tall and 125 pounds, I was a good seven or eight inches taller than her. She wiped her tears and looked up at me, her cheeks still wet. Mr. I'm sorry. What was your name again, I told her, and she continued. I'm going to take my lunch break and we should go somewhere so you can show him what he's lost. I'll send a picture afterward, of just me if you prefer, to show him. Mrs. Wooliver, you're a beautiful woman, and I'm truly honored by the offer, even if it is fueled by anger rather than desire. But no, ma am, you won't do that, I said, holding her a bit tighter trying to help her move past the anger and focus on the more important aspect of moving forward. I can't let you do that, and I can't do that to you. Revenge might seem tempting, but you have to live with yourself for the rest of your life. You don't want to do anything that you'll always regret later. You also don't want to do anything that could cause legal issues. Perhaps that snapped her out of her grief, as she let go and took a step back. You're right, I suppose. I gave him another chance. But this is the end, and we'll end up in court this time. I don't know how. I've included the name and contact information for the private investigation service in case you need them for further investigation or if you need someone to testify. I've also included the name of the attorney they recommended. He seems reliable and has been very responsive with my case so far. He filed the necessary paperwork and had it served this morning. Crestfallen, she took the envelope and thanked me before starting to walk away. However, she stopped and said, Mr. Jarreau, I hate to ask, but may I call you if I need advice, you'll find my number in the envelope. After visiting the testing lab that Donna Hightower suggested, I anxiously waited for a few days while managing a project in South Georgia. It was nice to have some distance from Reagan and her reckless behavior, but the thought of possibly contracting something dangerous made me even angrier. Fortunately, later in the week, the testing lab informed me that I didn't have any transmitted diseases. I felt relieved that at least I didn't have to worry about that. Reagan was still trying to reach me, leaving messages on my work voicemail and cell phone, even though I ignored them. When I got back to my office on Friday morning, I found more messages waiting for me. I quickly deleted them and decided to block her number. Minutes later, that problem was solved, and I made plans to visit my parents over the weekend. Reagan had been leaving messages for them too, so I took the initiative and blocked her number on their phones as well. Mom was particularly upset, especially since she knew we were planning to have children. She even asked me to reconsider the divorce, claiming that whatever Reagan did couldn't have been that bad. I showed her one carefully cropped photo with the date stamp visible. Tears streamed down her face as she nodded, finally accepting the truth despite her desire to deny it. As I waved goodbye and headed to my temporary accommodations, she clung tightly to Dad. The next day at work, Andy Smith came rushing into my office with bad news just before noon. Trent, 
Mary Jo Bolecki's water just broke, several weeks before she was planning to take maternity leave. What are we going to do? The appropriate response would have been to say a prayer for MJ and the babies, send them a gift, and send Andy home to prepare, since he was meant to replace Mary Jo during her time off. Andy hadn't seemed too thrilled about it when he first found out, as it forced him to finish his current project a couple weeks early, but Mr. Strickland believed he was the best fit. Now, though, Andy looked panicked since his project was still almost a month away from completion. After reviewing our project schedules, Andy and I went to Mr. Strickland with an alternative proposal. Instead of disrupting Andy's project, I offered to take over the New Orleans job in his place, while still being available to assist with major issues on our other projects and providing help in Baton Rouge if needed. We received news early that evening that Mary Jo and her newborn twins were doing well. As I got closer to the Big Easy to assume the project, I felt like I was moving further away from Reagan and my past. It was late by the time I arrived at my hotel, so I quickly fell asleep in preparation for an early start at the job site. I spent the morning diving deeper into the project, meeting with subcontractors, and reviewing plans for the upcoming weeks. Everything was in order, as expected, so I left early that afternoon to run some errands and visit Mary Jo in the hospital. She had already received the flowers I sent, so I gave her a thank you note for her hard work on the project and a gift certificate for her children, who were in the neonatal intensive care unit until they grew a bit stronger. Although I couldn't visit them in person, I was able to see them on a monitor while MJ and Ozzy lovingly watched over them. I felt incredibly happy for them, but the realization that I may never have children of my own caused a pang of sadness as I left. I refocused my mind on the project and immersed myself in it for the next few days. On Friday, I invited the construction office management staff out for drinks in the French Quarter after we shut down for the weekend. On Monday, George Godwin called with an update on my divorce. He had been dealing with numerous calls from Reagan, who seemed to become more desperate with each one. You sure you don't want to talk to her, he asked. I laughed sarcastically in response, and he chuckled loudly on the other end of the line. I thanked him and returned to work. There was a text message on my phone when I got to my hotel room that evening. I didn't recognize the number, but the message said, Hi Trent, my attorney filed my paperwork today and Noah has been served. Can we talk when you get a chance? Thanks, Melissa W. It was late, so I sent a text asking if she was still awake. Seconds later, my phone rang. Hi Trent, thanks for talking to me of course, Melissa. How are you holding up? It's tough. But I'll manage, she replied hesitantly. And you knowing that she didn't fully open up when I offered, I said, sounds about the same as you, Melissa. What's going on? There was a short silence before she spoke again, saying, Trent, I wanted to thank you for what you did, exposing what Noah was doing to me, and then making me think before I did something hasty. You could have taken advantage of how vulnerable I was in that moment, but you didn't, making me stop and think so I could realize how wrong that would have been. I really appreciate that, and I appreciate your help. This is going to be tough, but I'm determined to get through it. Melissa, we were in the same place at the time, and it would have been wrong for both of us. I'm in a better place now, at least a little better, including being away from her, and I'm glad to hear, if not hope, at least determination in your voice. Definitely. Still a long way to go, but definitely better than it was good. I started to tell her if she ever needed to talk that she could call me, but I hesitated. Not sure about that. Her soon-to-be ex was a terrible person, but he was that, first and foremost to her, not me. I was just collateral damage for him when he took advantage of my ex's apparently welcoming invitation, but I still had plans for him, too. So I kept my mouth shut and we wished each other luck before saying goodbye. While the New Orleans job was going well, I was, based on Mr. Strickland's orders, also still providing oversight on the Baton Rouge job, and was being called frequently for advice on other projects. It wasn't long before I felt like I was, in Louisiana language, in the swamp and up to my armpits and alligators. George contributed to part of that a couple of weeks later when he called and said, Trent, got some news. Mrs. Jarrow's lawyer has asked the judge to mandate counseling. If he does that, you'll have to meet her face to face here in Atlanta for at least a couple of sessions, maybe more. The judge will give you a window and you'll have to appear here in town or it won't go well for you in the proceedings. 
What do you want me to do? My blood was boiling that they'd use this tactic, but George had told me early on that it was possible. When we filed, we went with the minimum documentation on her unfaithfulness. You said we could hold on to the rest since it shouldn't be needed. It may be needed now what would happen if the judge saw that. We'd have to give it to her attorney, but Judge Johnson might agree to quash the request dot 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 if. He doesn't have a stroke on seeing it warn him first then and do it. A week later, Reagan's request for counseling was denied, though George said Judge Johnson implied that she might want to do some counseling on her own for her addiction problem, and that was one alligator out of the swamp. Over the next few months, as Reagan and her attorney fought George and the Georgia court, I kept a low profile, hoping that Reagan hadn't hired someone to find me...or, possibly harm me. Just in case on the latter, I had George redo my will and I changed my life insurance policy to ensure that she wouldn't get a dime if something were to happen to me. However, once Mary Jo and Ozzy's kids got out of the hospital, I visited them for dinner a couple of times and even babysat one evening so the lovebirds could get out of the house for some peace and quiet. The twins were quiet for the first few minutes after their parents left, but then realized that something was going on and they let me have it with all four lungs. As much as I wanted kids, I prayed afterward that if the good Lord ever let me have any children, he'd let me have them one at a time. To my surprise, I also heard from Melissa Wooliver a few times, checking in on how my proceeding was going and essentially asking for strength and courage to get through her own without ever saying the words. Because of Georgia law and divorce code, Georgia's warnings, and my own personal morals, I was careful not to ever step over any lines that could be misconstrued as or twisted into anything romantic or potentially adulterous. As Melissa's case became more set, she apparently didn't need me anymore so her messages stopped coming. As Mary Jo's maternity leave wound down, I had a realtor looking for a home to purchase. Using funds from my pre-Reagan account for the down payment, I closed on a house in Dunwoody a few weeks before MJ's return. Having spent nearly three months in the extended stay place at the company's expense, I was determined to be more comfortable when I got home and be able to get my things out of storage. The twins were doing well when Mary Jo's maternity leave ended, so she came back to work for the last few months of the project. As I handed the reins back over to her, I found myself leaving to return home with three regrets. The first was that since we didn't currently have another project lined up in New Orleans, MJ would be leaving our firm to become a stay-at-home mom for a while. Ozzie, who had family in the area, had gotten a tenure-track position as an associate professor at Loyola during their stay, so it wasn't a surprise. However, MJ asked me to keep her in mind if we had other work in the New Orleans area in the near future, to which I readily agreed. Second, with my return to Atlanta, I'd be leaving my unofficial godchildren and what had become more frequent babysitting gigs for MJ and Ozzy behind. The babies had apparently gotten used to me visiting and taking care of them sometimes on the weekend so their parents could go out and I knew that I'd miss seeing them grow. Taking care of them was a reminder of my own childless state due to the nightmare to which Reagan had sentenced me. Finally, Reagan had been fighting me over details on the divorce and it was dragging on though George Godwin assured me that Judge Johnson was getting as fed up with it as I was and that the end of the case was near. Therefore, when I returned to Atlanta, I moved right into the new house and started unpacking and having some work done during a week of comp time. I met a few of my new neighbors, too, including a friendly divorcee just a few doors down. Having a home once more gave me more freedom, but I was still legally tied to Reagan, meaning that I couldn't start dating again without fear of upsetting the proceedings. I thanked Noelle, the divorcee, for the plate of brownies but politely took a rain check when she suggested we get together sometime for dinner. Having been through the divorce system before, I think she understood. Ethan, who was forever looking for Miss Wright and who didn't know anything about the court system in Georgia, didn't understand. So when are you going to put yourself back out there, he asked one day at lunch soon after I got back to Atlanta. When the judge says my divorce is final and I can be sure that romantic endeavors and any fun that might result won't potentially contribute a single penny to Reagan's settlement that long, eh? So how's she doing these days? He asked. Don't know and don't care you know you still owe her. Big time I looked at my best friend and nodded. I know. And she'll get it when the time comes. Every single bit.
Judge Johnson finally had enough of Reagan's stalling and antics he required that we both be in the courtroom for final statements and presentations in early April, with Reagan and her attorney on one side of the court and George and me on the other. I arrived a few minutes early and was waiting for George when I saw Reagan turn a corner, spot me, and head my way. Trent, this didn't have to be this way I know, Reagan, but you couldn't live up to your part of our vows so it, it is what it is you were gone so much. Nonsense. You knew how much I'd be gone when you agreed to marry me. The three times during our time together that I exceeded that amount, by a day each time, I used comp time to more than make it up to you. Of course, I'm not counting that last trip to Tampa and Orlando in those three, since you made up for it yourself with your boss and your other friends while I was gone, and after I got back, she looked angrier than I'd ever seen her, and tears streamed down her face. Trent, but I had needs. You know how much I needed intimacy she'd always wanted an intimate relationship, even from our first date, seeking the euphoric feeling like a thrill-seeker looking for the next adventure. However, I believed her when she promised that she'd be able to control herself. I didn't know how long she'd succeeded, if she ever had at all, and didn't really care, so I replied, Don't give me that I gave you the best companion on the market to help tide you over while I was gone, and any number of what you claimed, rather vocally at times, were the best time ever both before and afterward. Reagan had noticed that several people were observing us, so she said, Can we go somewhere and talk through this? No, I don't see the need. You see, we talked about all of this before we agreed to marry and you promised that your wandering days were over since you wanted to get married, settle down, and have a family. You got married, all right, but failed at that and at the rest. Why don't you just live with that and let it go? I have. Of course, if you can't, you can always get another therapist. Maybe this one will have more luck than the other one she winced at my words and practically recoiled when I pointed out her failures. The number of people looking our way had grown, so I left her standing there in tears, overwhelmed by her frustration. When I saw George heading my way, Trent, please, she called, but George and I headed into the courtroom, ignoring the rest. The judge had required that we both be there to sign the paperwork, probably to prevent Reagan from dragging it out even longer. He commented on the fact that it was the first time he'd seen us together, leading to an outburst from Reagan, followed by a miserable cry. Judge Johnson silenced her and then made her listen to his pronouncement. When it was all over, the gavel fell, putting an end to it in our five-year marriage. I shook George's hand and thanked him after Judge Johnson left the courtroom, but as I turned to walk away, Reagan started pleading as she made her way toward me. When I kept going, ignoring her, she began to shout at me, anger and harsh words flowing. Most people know not to do that in the courtroom, and I'm sure Reagan did too, but her anger got the best of her. I'm not sure if one of the court officers arrested her or not, for George Godwin and I used the time to slip out. We'd had our talk, the one she wanted so much, even though it probably hadn't gone as she wanted, and that was plenty for me. I didn't care to ever speak with her again. George set out to ensure that. With her public display, George filed for a restraining order the next day, and Judge Johnson readily agreed. I couldn't have arranged it any better if I'd tried. With the restraining order in place, Reagan would stay out of my hair, whether she wanted to be or not. I almost hoped she wouldn't a brief stay in the Iron Bar Inn might do her some good. She was too smart for that, though, gone from my life and out of my view, so that next weekend I started dating again, calling in the rain check date with Noelle. She was nice, but it was soon obvious that we had little in common, other than a very long dry spell. When I took her home, she pulled me inside and I didn't resist. We had a great time together. Trent, we can do this again sometime, if you'd like. She said, confirming my suspicion from dinner, that she wasn't looking for anything long-term, much less anything permanent. I thanked her with a hug and headed down the street for home just minutes later. Noelle and I remained casual friends, but we never got together again. I went out with another woman the following weekend, and then another in Birmingham during a trip the following week. I felt drained often in more ways than one following each date when I realized that, despite the pleasure of the moment, I was getting nowhere close to my goal of finding the right woman. I wanted a friend, a lover, and a lifetime companion, someone with whom I could eventually start a family. Over the next two months, I began to have doubts that would ever happen, that I'd ever have any success finding long-term happiness. 
Still, short-term happiness was fairly frequent and quite pleasurable until Independence Day weekend while visiting my parents and watching my sister, her husband, and their four kids. Mom, knowing me better than I suspected, told me that afternoon that I'd probably never give her and dad any grandchildren if I didn't make a change. I know, Mom. I've bought a house and am fixing it up, Trent. A house doesn't make a home. A man and a good woman, not one of the people you've been dating, can if they work at it. Son, what you need is to find a good woman. I know that, Mom, and I will someday I'll find one. Just give me time, she huffed. If we keep giving you more time, your father and I will be dead by then and will never meet our grandchildren, she was teasing, at least partially, but it still made me think. One evening in late July, I received a text message. Hi, Trent. It's Melissa Wooliver. Can you talk sometime when you have a moment? Quite honestly, I was surprised to hear from her again after so long. I finished cleaning my paint sprayer and then sent her a brief reply to call when she could. She did, just moments later. Hi, Trent. Thanks for agreeing to talk to me. No problem, Melissa. How are things going for you? We haven't spoken in a long time, and that's part of the reason I was hesitant to send the message tonight. I wasn't sure if, considering all that happened, if you'd want to talk to me again. I laughed. Unless you've had an active part in my ex-wife and your husband getting ex-husband, as of today, she interjected. Together, then I don't hold you responsible for anything that happened between them or for the disaster they created, so I have no reason not to talk to you. Good, because I swear, I had nothing to do with it I never thought you did. So what's up? Well, it's taken longer than expected, but, like I said, I'm finally free at last. I even have my maiden name, Ortiz. Again, and I wanted to thank you for your help. You opened my eyes to what the jerk was doing. You gave me the proof at no charge so I didn't have to spend money I couldn't afford to get it, and then gave me advice on what I needed to do. I went with another attorney, but you were a big help, Trent, and I appreciate it. You're quite welcome, so don't give it another thought, okay? That's hard, Trent, because you dot 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 you were my, well, guiding light, my inspiration, if you will, when I was so low and so down. I don't know you well at all, but I like what you did and what I've seen so far, so I'm going to take a chance and do something I've never done before as a result. Would you have dinner with me? It was a very nice dinner, but I spent the evening looking at her, thinking how sweet and beautiful she was, and how her ex-husband had to be the biggest idiot in the world to step out on her rather than thinking about what we were eating. True. Reagan was equally beautiful and had her own particular brand of attractiveness, but having learned of her secret dark side, the side that would betray the person she was supposed to love more than any other, her former 11 rating had sunk to negative numbers. At least in my eyes. You're staring, she said with a grin. Almost as much as me I chucked as I nodded. It's fun to really focus when you have someone so nice to focus on she blushed, putting her hand over mouth to hide how much she liked my compliment. Do you want to get out of here? And dot 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 maybe dot dot go back to my place I think I'd like that she leaned forward and hugged me, right over the middle of our little table, and I left cash for our meal and the tip rather than having to wait for our server to run my card. We went arm in arm like new lovers, taking a bit of a break from our journey on reaching my SUV. Minutes later, as we turned onto her street, she reached into her purse and drew out her phone. Pull in the garage, she said. The doors opened we'd barely made it in when I heard the door closing, and we were hugging again, right there in the car. I suggested, inside yes, she said. Inside Trent. I jumped out and ran around to open the door for her, but found she wasn't waiting. She was out and in my arms, so I scooped her up and carried her in the house. She got the lock undone and shoved the door open before telling me which way to get to the stairs. Her shoes came off somewhere along the way, but I didn't notice. My room's there at the end, she said, so I followed her directions and put her down moments later. Oh, Trent. I've been longing for this moment since the day you first came to my office. I haven't been close since before that, and the thoughts of being with you have kept me going. And you know what? It was even more amazing, much better than I ever imagined. The blissful feeling engulfed me, and her sweet words made it even more wonderful. I would have happily stayed there for some time, but I suddenly realized I needed to hurry up. You're so beautiful. I whispered in response, and that was beyond anything I could have ever imagined. But for now, I need to. 
She nodded in understanding, giving me a smile. We spent good time together before sleep eventually overcame us. The next morning, we woke up and did it all over again. I felt grateful that it was a Saturday and I didn't have work, because I could see myself staying with her forever. Melissa had a demure aura in everyday life, but sometimes she became like a passionate tiger and an insatiable bunny at times. After our morning tryst, she fell asleep, so I carefully slipped out of bed and made my way to the bathroom. As I walked out, the morning light streamed through the curtains, revealing a clearer view of her bedroom. Our clothes were scattered around, reminding me of our passionate moments. I also noticed the queen-size bed, its pillows slightly rearranged after being knocked off the floor during our activities. ATV sat on a stand near a recliner, angled so she could easily watch it from bed. However, it was Melissa's dresser that caught my attention. There were several photos on it, so I took a quick glance before one particular photo made me stop. It may not have been the most polite thing to do, but I picked it up to get a closer look. Trent, what are you doing Melissa asked from the bed. Melissa, who is the little girl in these photos that's my daughter Ansley? She's three years old, and she means the world to me. Her words surprised me, and I said, you never mentioned her before. I wanted to keep her out of the mess with Noah, so I tried my best to protect her during the divorce process. She actually became the main obstacle in finalizing it. Trent, I don't want you to meet her unless we both agree that we're serious and there might be a future for us. Where is she now? I tried to keep my voice steady, but it may have trembled slightly. She's with him this weekend. Why? Is something wrong? I genuinely cared about her, but this revelation caught me off guard. It carried so much weight, and I wasn't sure what it meant. Melissa, I don't know. I really like you. I like you a lot, I admitted, going against my usual instinct to take things slow. Considering how long we've known each other, I like you a lot more than I probably should. But if there's one person I dislike as much as my ex-wife, it's your ex-husband. It's a tough situation, to say the least. I've mentioned before that I want children. That so you can imagine that if things worked out between us, I would want to be involved in your daughter's life. But let's think about that for a moment. If I attend her soccer game, piano recital, cheer practice, or school dance, who else will be there Noah, she whispered, starting to understand. He's a deceitful, unfaithful person, but he does love her. Exactly. And every time I see him at one of those events, it will remind me of what he did to my ex-wife and to my marriage. I would resent him greatly, and I think Ansley, even if she doesn't fully understand, would sense the tension between us. Eventually, she might resent me for it, and that could harm any potential relationship I could have with her, as well as our own relationship, yours and mine. As much as it hurts me to say this, I think it would eventually ruin whatever connection we have. She sat up, clutching the sheet to her chest. Speaking in a hushed voice, she said, with understanding you're saying that there's no future for us as much as I wish I could be proven wrong. No, I don't believe there is, I agreed. She nodded, tears streaming down her face. I thought it was too good to be true. Now I know it was. Please, Trent, just go, she tapped her phone a couple of times and added, the garage door will be open for you. She fell back onto the bed and buried herself in the sheets, crying. I gathered my clothes, dressing quietly in the hallway as every step felt heavy with sorrow, almost as heavy as the disdain I felt for her ex-husband. It pained me, but deep down, I knew it was true. Later that day, I went to visit my parents. I gave them a condensed and censored version of what happened, but they could tell there was more to it and that I was struggling more than I let on. My mom tried to pry more information from me, but I shook my head, telling her it was over and would never work out. Even though I wanted to believe her reassurances, I couldn't see it at the time. On Sunday, we met my sister and her family for lunch after church. Since there was a long wait for a table, she pulled me aside and convinced me to open up. She was two years older and had always been there for me through each failed teenage crush, so I trusted her and shared most of my story, without including any intimate details. Although I suspected she could sense that part as well. I understand why it would be difficult, she said afterward. But I think if you truly love her, you could make it work. One date isn't enough to reveal everything, and perhaps with more time, you might realize that there isn't as much between you two as you think. However, 
It might also prove to you that there is something worth fighting for, if you're willing to try. Thanks, sis. You're right, one date doesn't define everything. However, it did provide enough insight for me to understand that it would hurt even more if I got closer to her and then saw it all fall apart because of the past listen, little brother. You won't know for sure unless you give it a chance I nodded, agreeing to consider her words. Then, our table was called, so we didn't discuss it any further. However, it stayed with me for the rest of the ride home and in the days that followed. Ethan understood my thoughts on the matter better than anyone else, but I started to question his agreement on the way home from a trip to a plant site near LaGrange. Considering Ethan's terrible luck with relationships, I wondered if having him agree with me was really a good thing. The following weekend, he set us up on a double date with two women. We had a great time, and I soon forgot about my doubts. During the divorce, Reagan wanted to keep our home as part of the settlement, so I had George resist and force the sale. She couldn't afford the buyout without giving up other things she wanted. I know it was a bit petty, but I thought it was karma considering the circumstances. I didn't lose any sleep over it. To protect myself from being taken advantage of, I had George represent me in the sale. He knew Reagan's attorney from before, so they were on speaking terms. George found out that Reagan was in the process of buying a condo. I later heard a rumor through the grapevine that Reagan and Noah were getting married. I immediately called George to discuss the potential impact on my finances. During the divorce, George argued that no financial support should be provided to Reagan since she was the one who cheated. However, the judge considered our incomes and awarded her a small monthly amount for five years or until she remarried, whichever came first. That was the only point George lost in the settlement, if she really remarried. I'll look into it and let you know. If it's true, we can stop the support, said George. Yeah, if it's true, it just goes to show some people never learn, I said in disbelief. I couldn't help but think about them being together and what it would mean, further validating my decision to end things with Melissa. George laughed. That's what keeps me in business. And, I thought, it gives me an option I'd considered at the beginning of my divorce but never thought would actually be possible. Upon learning about their marriage, I reached out to a friend in Reagan's firm, Will Kleiner. We had been acquaintances in college and had reconnected when I started dating Reagan. Will worked in a different department within the same firm. Reagan and I had gone out with Will and his wife a few times while we were dating and married. However, I hadn't seen Will since before the divorce. So, we decided to meet for lunch one day. When I shared what had happened, Will said, That's terrible, Trent. I heard that Woolliver requested a transfer to a different department. Now it all makes sense. They're trying to avoid any conflicts with our human resources department. Does your firm have an official policy regarding this definitely? They can get in serious trouble if they violate it and it could potentially harm the firm too, Will. I hate to ask, but do you think you could get me a copy of that section of your HR manual? Yes, just promise me you won't reveal where you got it from the following Saturday. I had a date with someone and we met Will and Lori Kleiner for a Braves game. Will handed me a flash drive that night and a few days later, I went to see George to discuss everything. Trent, I'm sorry. Although that's what their policy says, even if you can prove that Noah Wooliver was in relationships with multiple women while working at the firm. He said, chuckling, that doesn't give you grounds to sue. The state law doesn't allow for lawsuits related to alienation of affection in Georgia. The legislature got rid of that law back in 79. That means you can't sue anyone for attracting or distracting your spouse, be including the firms they work for damn while I didn't care about the money. I was hoping that holding the firm accountable would make them take action against Noah and maybe even Reagan. He smiled. Many people have said that word or worse, upon learning this fact. What it means is that no one can sue the firm unless they were explicitly informed about the situation and chose to do nothing about it. Even in those cases, the chances of winning a significant amount of money are very low. Most lawyers wouldn't take such a case I sighed, repeating, damn. He laughed. Hey, don't give up hope. Let's focus on ending the spousal support now, and then we can discuss other options later on the following week. George filed a motion at the courthouse. We provided proof of Reagan and Noah's marriage license, and George argued that spousal support was no longer necessary or appropriate according to our divorce decree. 
Reagan's lawyer opposed the motion, but the judge agreed with us and dismissed the support. I was relieved to be free from the monthly payments that had bothered me since they began. When I mentioned the second issue to George, he shook his head and wagged his finger. Be patient, Trent. Let's deal with the spousal support first, and then we can explore other options. Six months later, George called me and we met for lunch, Trent. The reason I suggested waiting is because newlyweds need time to adjust. In this case, with Noah moving to a different department within the same firm, he's going to be cautious for a while. We need to give him time to settle in dot 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 and find another target. Just as the honeymoon phase starts to fade, based on what you told me in my experience with guys like him, now might be a good time to gather some information it took two, two weeks. But Donna Hightower and one of her investigators discovered that serial cheaters don't change. Noah Wooliver was in a relationship with one of his new employees. George compiled the evidence and approached one of his attorney friends. We don't want your involvement to be discovered, Trent. If the judge sees any connection between you and Mr. Wooliver losing his job, Reagan might be able to request spousal support again. I doubt she'll find out because I won't be telling her, and if anything happens to Noah the asshole, I don't think he'll reveal the true reason behind it. George grinned and shook his finger at me. Very sneaky. And true George's attorney friend delivered the package to Noah's firm. My friend will inform me that security escorted Noah out of the building the same afternoon, and it seemed like he wouldn't be returning. Reagan was crying when she found out, but no one was telling her why. Take that, asshole, I whispered after I hung up the phone. If I continue down this path, I risk becoming a bitter old man grinning to myself. I knew it was a risk I was willing to take. To avoid any association with the matter, I anonymously overnighted a package that same day. The next evening, I received a phone call. Trent. Melissa Ortiz exclaimed, I know we may never speak again, but I had to call and tell you. Last night, Noah called and informed me that he was laid off from his firm due to corporate cutbacks. He said he will be requesting a reduction in alimony as a result. I spoke to someone from his firm, and it seems like he was actually fired. Then today, I received an anonymous package that probably explains everything. This should help the judge maintain my spousal support when Noah files his request. Trent, I have a feeling I know who to thank for this. So, to that person, I say thank you, I chuckled. Isham, dot, 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 I think if you found the right person to talk to, they would say you're welcome. Unfortunately, they wouldn't admit to doing it. As for what was in the package, let's just say that some people never learn. I'm sure Noah will try to play the victim and ask the judge for sympathy. But when my attorney presents this information in response, I hope the judge throws Noah's words right back at him. He just got remarried, for goodness sake. I wonder if he started cheating again as soon as we got married. Melissa, don't dwell on the past. Leave it behind and embrace the present. Just smile and enjoy your life, okay? You deserve it. We said our goodbyes, unsure if it would be the last time. With that, I smiled. It was the first time in a long while that I felt liberated. I had gone through so much, survived the challenges, and though some might disagree, I had fought back just as fiercely as Reagan and Noah had hurt me. But I didn't push it too far. While Reagan was probably still cheating on her new partner, I had helped her end up in a worse financial situation and with a husband who needed to pay child support and alimony. I knew she was in a relationship where her partner was being unfaithful, but I chose not to tell her, just like she didn't tell me what she had done. I tried to provide the best for her and make her happy, but now I suspected that she had more worries than she could count. I fought back against them, and I didn't regret it one bit. In fact, as I reflected on everything, I realized that I no longer used the derogatory names that filled my mind. After seeking revenge, I no longer had to think of them or care about their opinions. And that realization brought the biggest smile to my face. However, that smile didn't last. In the next few weeks, I made a difficult discovery. Despite thinking that I had settled the score with Reagan and Noah, I still felt their presence in my life. When I thought I had a chance at happiness with Melissa, I let that chance go because of the memories of what my ex and Melissa's ex had done, of the embarrassment they had caused me, and, I'm sure, her too. I had been on several dates and had romantic encounters with other women since then, but it became increasingly clear that none of it mattered to me once the initial excitement had faded. I finally realized that Melissa, alongside Reagan and Noah, 
was still on my mind. I couldn't truly be free from their influence if I cared about what they thought. I needed to reach a point where I could look at them and laugh, saying, look at what you missed out on because of your foolishness. Thank you for being so ignorant, only then would I find true freedom. So it became clear to me. I knew exactly what I needed to do. I picked up the phone and dialed the number Melissa had called from the day she received the file about Noah's infidelity. I hoped she would answer. After a few moments, she did. Hi, Melissa. It's Trent Giroux. Can we talk for a moment, Trent? You helped me again when you didn't have to. I'm listening. Something dawned on me tonight, an unexpected realization, and if I'm not too late and you're willing, I'd like to discuss it with you to see if there's a chance for change. There was a brief silence on the line, but I could hear her breathing. So, I continued. Despite suggesting that you let go of the past, I have come to see that I, myself, have been so fixated on the past and what ruined my life as I knew it, that I failed to look at things from a different perspective. I want to genuinely apologize for that, and if you will allow it, I would like the opportunity to make things right. If you'll have me. She didn't interrupt me, so I spoke to her that evening, and I could almost hear Melissa nodding in agreement on the other end of the line. To my relief, she wasn't seeing anyone new, and to my surprise, she agreed to allow us to start over and see where things would lead. We promised to take things slow and be patient, but sometimes, life has its own plans. When I walked her to her front door, she invited me inside. She got glasses, and I poured wine before we settled on her couch and talked until late into the night. When I mentioned that it was getting late, we shared a goodnight hug, but it didn't end there. The effect of our actions was apparent, despite our initial intentions. We stayed there, hugging each other in silence. No words were necessary. It was too soon. Considering this was just our second first date, but in my heart, I hoped that things would work out between us, and from the way she looked at me, I could sense she felt the same. Trent, you don't have to leave. I mean, if you want, you can stay. I smiled back at her, leaned in, and hugged her. I would love that. I would love that very much, though we encountered challenges in the months that followed. We discovered that we were more aligned than we had anticipated. The little things didn't matter as much when two people genuinely cared for each other. After our second chance date, I realized that my feelings for her were growing with each passing encounter. I admitted to myself that it was so much more than just liking her. Melissa reached the same conclusion, and together, we started planning and working towards a future together. That's what we both wanted, so we got married a little over a year after deciding to give it another try. When the day came, little Ansley walked down the aisle as our flower girl. Melissa and I exchanged our vows, and we meant every word. Although I feared running into Noah at times, things didn't unfold as I had anticipated. The first time we crossed paths, he started to make a snarky comment about me settling for second place, but I cut him off. Speaking softly so only he could hear, I whispered, Noah, thank you for taking Reagan, the unfaithful person, off my hands. If you believe she will be more faithful to you than she was to me, you are even more foolish than I thought. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to be with Melissa, a remarkable woman who you weren't wise enough to be faithful to or fight for. Trust me, I got the better end of the deal. He almost choked on his words and clenched his fists in anger before realizing that I could easily defeat him if he tried anything. Reason took over just in time, saving both him and Ansley from pain. He turned around and went back to his daughter, picked her up, and hugged her. Then, he whispered something to her before bidding Melissa goodnight. A few months later, he accidentally mentioned to her that he was going through his own divorce from Reagan, and that he finally understood the truth of what I had said. When he tried to make a suggestion, Melissa shut him down firmly. It's a shame you only realized it when it was too late, Noah. Don't ever bring it up again. In the times we have seen each other since then, Noah has never said another word about it, but I notice a glimmer of regret in his eyes when he sees us together. And I always smile. Present-day Ansley is now six years old, spending time at her grandparents' house. Meanwhile, I am holding Melissa's hand as she grips mine tightly, as if there's no tomorrow. When the doctor gives the order, Finally, it is done. She collapsed back, and I hugged her while the doctor and nurse attended to our newborn. The obstetrician looks up with a smile and says, Mr. 
and Mrs. Giroux, congratulations. Since you chose not to find out in advance, let me be the first to tell you that you have a beautiful baby boy. And with that, all of the challenges and difficulties getting to this point were worth it, and I realized, as challenging as it had been, I wouldn't have changed a single thing. 